Uh, you know, all over this country, people are giving God an hour and feeling like they did God a favor, you know. I still believe all day Sunday is the Lord's day, and I believe God's people ought to honor him that way. And I want to commend you for being here tonight, and I want to encourage you to be here Monday night, Tuesday night, Wednesday night, and let's have all that God has for us. I want you to open the Word of God with me, if you will. Let's pick up right where we left off, shall we? In the New Testament book of 1 Peter, uh, chapter number 2, and we'll read just a few verses again that we looked at this morning. And then I'm going to take a little detour from this portion to another scripture. So be ready. Stay with me, would you? 1 Peter chapter 2, look at verse number 9. But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and a holy nation. A peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, which in time past were not a people, but are now the people of God, which had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims, Abstain from fleshly lust, which war against the soul. Having your conversation honest among the Gentiles, that whereas they speak against you as evildoers, they may by your good works, which they shall behold, glorify God in the day of visitation. I had you mark in your Bible in verse 11 this expression, strangers and pilgrims. We began early this morning in the book of Exodus. And we talked about the heart of a stranger, what it means to be a pilgrim. It's a mindset. It is, it's deeper than just saying, well, that person looks different. It means that deep within them, they understand that they belong to another world. And I'm, I'm praying even right now while I'm preaching, dear God, give us the heart of a stranger this week. And then in the next hour this morning, we looked at this portion of Scripture at the honesty of the strangers. The Bible says we're to have an honest conversation among the Gentiles. We're to give a testimony of who Christ is in our life. When people see you, they ought not just see you. They ought to see Jesus in you. I hear people say all the time, you know, the closer people get to us, the more of our flaws they see. That is true. That is true. Because the nearer you get to somebody, the more you're around them, the people you know best, people you live with, you see their failures and their weaknesses and all of that. But may I say, if you are a growing Christian and you are becoming more and more like the Lord Jesus every day, when people get near you, it should not just be your flaws that they see. It should be the Lord's beauty that they see. I remember years ago hearing the story of a young boy on the streets of Chicago, I believe it was, and he was just living on the streets. It was cold. He had no coat and holes in his shoes and all of that. And a kind woman came by, a woman of means, and saw him, and she said, son, come with me, and she took him in a diner and fed him a big meal, biggest meal it had in months and months, took him across the street to the department store and bought him new shoes and a coat and gloves and hat and scarf, and I mean, she outfitted him. And they walked out on the street, and he looked up, and he said, ma'am, can I ask you a question? Are you Jesus' mother? And she said, no, son, but I, I am his child. And he said, I knew you were related to him one way or another. And I wonder sometimes if anybody ever looks at us and thinks we're related to Jesus, that's what it means to live as honest strangers. But tonight, I want to speak to you on yet another aspect of what it means to be strangers in this world, pilgrims. On our way, as John Bunyan wrote to the celestial city, what does that look like? Well, there's a word that I want you to mark in your Bible. It's a word that doesn't get much attention. We don't talk about it much. And frankly, we don't see much of it today, but it's still in the Bible. It's verse 9. When I stop, you say the next word out loud. Everybody got it? Verse 9, ready? But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and what? Mm. Does your Bible say holy? Yes. You may want to mark in your Bible in verse 9 the word holy and in verse 11 the word fleshly and connect the two in your Bible because the opposite of fleshly is holy. God's giving a great contrast here between those who are controlled by their lust and those who are controlled by the Lord. Those who live for their own pleasure and those who live for God's pleasure. And he says that God's people are a holy nation. Now, listen to me with your heart just a moment. I believe positionally we have been declared righteous before our God through the holy record of Jesus Christ. 
which means that when God looks at us, he does not see sinners, he sees saints. Aren't you glad for that? He sees his own children, sons and daughters of God. And I, I give God the glory and praise for that positionally. That is my standing in Christ Jesus, and nothing can change that because the blood has been applied to my account. But I want you to know that I believe God expects that what is true in our standing should be true in our daily life. And that what is true positionally ought to be practically worked out in the way we live every day. God expects his people to be a holy people. In fact, early on in Scripture, he said to his chosen nation, Be ye holy, for I, the Lord your God, am holy. Look, please, our holiness is directly connected to the holiness of our great God. May I ask you, has God become less holy? God forbid. Our God is the thrice holy God. Around the throne this night, these songs were beautiful, but you've never heard songs like the ones being sung around the throne at this moment. And at this moment around the throne, they are still singing, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. He always has been holy, he is holy, and he always will be holy. Holy is the Father, holy is the Son, holy is the Spirit. The God of the Bible is not a God that winks at sin. The God of the Bible is a God of utter holiness. But may I ask you, if God is no less holy than he was in the past, why are his people less holy? People say, well, you know, preacher, times have changed. Yeah, and people have changed. And I get it. This is not my granddaddy's generation. This, this is not the world that my great-grandpa served in. I, I get that. I understand all of that. I see the changes around. But I want to tell you tonight that my God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. That his truth endures to all generations. It transcends culture and it transcends time. And if the God of the Bible is a holy God, then God's people ought to be holy in every generation. And frankly, you don't hear much preaching about holiness anymore. Whatever happened to holiness? There used to be a great deal of talk about it. But you hear very little mention of even the word. When people say holy, people get kind of nervous. And on one hand, you've got worldly-minded people who just outright, outright rejected holiness. They've, they have changed the measuring stick now. It is no longer the Word of God. It is no longer the character of God. It is no longer the expectation of God. It is now this. What is culturally acceptable? What is moral? Listen to me very carefully. The mores of society change. They drift with the times. God's holiness is a fixed point of reference. It never changes. It's not what is legal. Men may say things are legal, but that doesn't mean the holy God smiles upon it. We're measuring by the wrong standard. So on one hand, you've got worldly people who've outright rejected holiness. They say, well, you know, that's not really for us anymore. We're, we're not into that kind of thing. And on the other hand, excuse me, you've got religious people who have reduced holiness to a list of rules that they keep, and as long as they keep the do's and the don'ts, then they're holy people. No, they may just be a bunch of Pharisees. So on one end, you got people rejecting holiness, and on the other end, you got people reducing holiness to their little small definition of it. And usually, it's all about the externals. For the record, I do believe it ought to make a difference in the way you live your life, but God never starts with the externals. He starts with the heart. And holiness begins in the hidden part of your life, the place where no preacher can go and no church member can see. It is the place, this moment, where the Holy Spirit of God is moving and searching. It's where the all-seeing, all-searching eyes of a holy God sees us. It's, it's in our motives. It's in our imaginations. It's in our desires. It's in our thought life. God, help us. It's in our feelings towards one another. It's in our fleshly reactions that the Spirit of God is working. What's he working to do? He's working to bring us in line to the holiness of our God and I speak tonight on the holiness of the strangers. Would you go back with me in your Bible to the Old Testament? Remember I said to you earlier today, it's woven through the Old and New Testament Scriptures. Go with me to Jeremiah 35. Because Jeremiah 35 is a divinely chosen example of what real holiness looks like among the strangers. It's a story of a group known as the Rechabites. Let's read just a little bit. Look in Jeremiah 35 verse 1. 
the word which came unto Jeremiah from the Lord in the days of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, saying, verse 2, go unto the house of the Rechabites and speak unto them. And bring them into the house of the Lord into one of the chambers and give them wine to drink. Everybody stop right there, lift your head and look at me. How many of you think it's strange that the Lord sends a message to the preacher and the message of the preacher is get all these people together, put them in a room, and tell them all to drink wine? How many of you think that sounds a little strange? For the record, this is not a message on liquor, but I'm, I'm against fermented beverages and alcohol because wine is still a mocker, strong drink is still raging, and whosoever is deceived thereby is not wise. But this passage actually is not about wine. It's about something bigger than that. Somebody said, you mean to tell me that God had had them set wine before these Rechabites and tell them to drink it, and yet the Bible says that we're not tempted of God. God tempts no man. Listen to me. God already knew something about the Rechabites. He was using them to teach the Israelites something. See, he already knew how they were going to respond because they'd been responding that way for 300 years. Watch this. He trusted them with the test. I wonder... If God could trust us with such a test. Verse 3, then I took Jezaniah, the son of Jeremiah, the son of Habazaniah and his brethren and all his sons and the whole house of the Rechabites. And I brought them into the house of the Lord, into the chamber of the sons of Hanan, the son of Igadaliah, a man of God, which was by the chamber of the princes, which was above the chamber of Messiah, the son of Shalem, the keeper of the door. And I set before the sons of the house of the Rechabites pots full of wine and cups. And I said unto them, drink ye wine. But they said, we will drink no wine. For Jonadab, the son of Rechab, our father, commanded us, saying, ye shall drink no wine, neither ye nor your sons forever. Neither shall you build house, nor sow seed, nor plant vineyard, nor have any. But all your days ye shall dwell in tents. And pay real close attention to the last part of verse number 7. That ye may live many days in the land where ye be what, church? We're back to the strangers, aren't we? The pilgrims are just passing through. Look at verse number 8. Here's the key to the whole thing. By the way, here's the key to the Christian life. Thus have we obeyed. This is not about liquor. This is not about wine. This is about obedience to God. Thus have we obeyed the voice of Jonadab, the son of Rechab, our father, in all that he charged us to drink no wine all our days. We, our wives, our sons, nor our daughters, nor to build houses for us to dwell in. Neither have we vineyard, nor field, nor seed, but we have dwelt in tents and have obeyed and done according to all that Jonadab, our father, commanded us. I want to say to this church tonight, that you're going to live to please somebody. And you'll have to pick. You're going to live to either please men or you're going to live to please God. And in the end, everybody obeys somebody. Somebody said, nobody's going to tell me what to do. All right, then you're the boss. So now you're living to please you. But somebody's going to be the boss. And you're going to have to choose who it is you're going to obey. What was old Vance Abner used to say? Uh, Abner used to say that we, we have lived so subnormal that if we ever become normal, it's going to appear abnormal. He was exactly right. In other words, we have lived such substandard kind of Christian lives, failing to line up with the Word of God, that if we ever really became the holy people God saved us to become, people are going to take notice of it because they're going to say, something has changed in the lives of those people. Watch this, please, because what is strange to God is right with the world, and what is right with God is strange to the world. And everybody's going to be strange to somebody. Everybody. Either God is going to look at you and say, something's wrong there, 
or the world's going to look at you and say, those people are different. But listen, you can't have it both ways. What, what did John write? First John chapter 2, the world passeth away and the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. You got to decide whether you're going to live in the world or whether you're going to live in the will of God, but you're going to have to choose whether you're going to be a holy pilgrim or not. And the sad reality is, we got a lot of people that clean up good for church on Sunday, but their heart is not clean. And we got a lot of preachers. I'm one of them who can get up and preach sermons without allowing the Lord to do that deep work in us that really he desires to do. I, I wrote something across the top of my Bible today as a prayer to God, not for you, but for me. Here is my prayer. Lord, be thorough with me. Now, be careful. If you start praying that prayer, God will answer that prayer. God will start uncovering things and showing you things. And it's, it's a little painful, but look, if you really want to have revival and see God do something, then the strangers and the pilgrims have to start saying to God, oh God, be thorough with me. And God chose this story of the Rechabites to teach his children something because here was, here was what was going on. The Israelites were not listening to God. And God said, I'm going to show you a people who've been listening to their daddy for 300 years and they'll listen to an earthly father, but you won't listen to the heavenly father. See, there's only two kinds of people in this room tonight besides saved and lost. I'm speaking just to the saved people right now. There are obedient Christians and there are disobedient Christians. And the way, the path of holiness is the path of obedience. Amen. See, you don't become holy by trying harder to do the right things and not do the wrong things. You become holy by saying to God, God, whatever you want, I will obey you. And step by step and moment by moment, you live in obedience to the promptings of the Holy Spirit of God that lives inside of you. Watch this. You don't make yourself holy. God makes you a partaker of his holiness. How did it happen with these Rechabites that they became holy strangers? Let me give you three thoughts. I want you to write them down somewhere. Take a pen out, would you please? Because these three things that they did are three things we can do. Number one, I want you to write down that they obeyed the truth. Their father, Jonadab, the son of Rechab, had instructed them, had given them truth. See, he understood some things they did not yet understand. As a matter of fact, when he said it, these people weren't even alive. But they just believed that what dad said came from God and it was the truth and they were going to obey it. And this, this theme of obedience is throughout. For example, would you mark please in verse 8, have we obeyed? In verse 10, have obeyed. In verse number 14, obey their father's commandment. Look at verse 18. Because ye have obeyed the commandment of Jonadab your father and kept all his precepts and done according to all that he hath commanded you. There was this spirit of obedience. Listen to me. Strangers live by laws of another land. They're governed by another world. And I know even our own government can say things that do not line up with the word of God. But at that moment, we all must choose whether we're going to obey God or we're going to obey man. That's a decision you'll have to make. But the true stranger mentality understands that there is one that we must obey, and that is the one who gives us the truth. Let me just show you something. Put your right hand right here in Jeremiah 35. We're coming right back. And with your left hand, go back to 2 Kings chapter 10 for a moment. Let's compare Scripture with Scripture. Here's the story. Remember Jonadab, the son of Rechab? Here he is, 2 Kings chapter 10, verse number 15. God has raised up one of his deliverers, one of his servants in verse 15. When he was departed thence, he lighted on Jehonadab, the son of Rechab, coming to meet him. So here's the guy. This is daddy. And he saluted him and said to him, what a question. Is thine heart right? as my heart is with thy heart. And Jehonadab said, answered, it is. If it be, give me thine hand. And he took him his hand, he gave him his hand, and he took him up to him into the chariot, and he said, come with me and see my zeal for the Lord. So they made him ride in his chariot, and when he came to Samaria, he slew all that remained in Ahab and Samaria till he destroyed him according to the saying of the Lord, which he spake to Elijah. Watch this, please. Here is a man that can say with a clear conscience, yes, my heart is right towards you, and yes, my heart is right towards God. And I'd like to look everybody in the room in the face for just a moment, and I want to ask you something tonight. Is your heart right with God? 
Only you can answer that. I can't tell you that. Your spouse can't speak for you. Your children might have a pretty good idea because they watch. But I'm asking in the secret hidden place of your heart, in the unseen areas of your life, in the cracks and crevices where nobody knows or goes, is your heart right with God? Is your heart right with others who are right with God? I love the fact he gets up in the chair and the, the zeal of the Lord just takes over. You know, it's a funny thing. When you first get saved, there's a whole lot of zeal for the Lord. What happens to God's children? What has happened to our zeal? They come against Ahab. They wipe out the wicked ones. This is the father, the ancestor of the Rechabites we're reading about in Jeremiah 35. Now go back to Jeremiah 35 with me. And somewhere, put a little note in your Bible. This is 300 years later. That's powerful. 300 years before, mm, daddy drew a line in the sand and said, I'm going to be right with God. I'm going to be a zealous follower of God. I'm going to associate with those who are zealous followers of God. I'm going to teach my children and my grandchildren to stay away from everything that corrupts and everything that would get them off the path. And I'm going to set in line a right heritage. Oh, praise God for this. And 300 years later, his descendants are still following that God in holiness. I'm going to tell you what we need. We need some families to get thoroughly right with God again. We need some daddies who will instruct their children again and some grandmas and grandpas that will use the God-given favor and influence you have over your descendants to set something in motion that will continue long after you are dead and gone. For the record, young people, we need some teenagers and some college students and young single adults who will be teachable and humble and willing to receive the truth from somebody that trod the path before you and say, by the grace of God, I don't want to drop the baton in the relay race. I want to receive the truth. I want to carry the truth, and I want to pass it on to the generation following. It begins by obeying the truth. The truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. And it guided them and it guarded them. Look at Jeremiah 35. Look how complete their obedience was. In verse 6, they said, we will drink how much wine? I didn't hear you. How much? Oh, just a little dab. It won't hurt. Half a glass, half a glass. It'd be all right. They said, nope. No wine. Look at verse number 6 again. Look at the end of it. Their father said, ye shall drink how much wine, church? Hmm, that's interesting. Look at verse 8. Thus have we obeyed the voice of Jonadab, the son of Rechab, our father, in all that he hath charged us to drink. How much wine, church? You getting the picture? No, no, no. And some of you are saying, yeah, well, this is a pretty negative kind of message on the no's. Let me tell you a little secret. You learn to take care of the yeses, and God will help you take care of the no's. You learn to say yes to God and yes to those who are guiding you in God's truth. Watch this. And when you take care of it on the positive side, God will be so big and wonderful in your life. You won't feel like you're missing out at all. And Christ will crowd out of your life all of those things that will bring unholiness and corruption. Let me just testify for a moment. I grew up in a family where mom and dad took us to church Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, revival meetings. We were there. And I'm just going to tell you, it didn't hurt us one iota. So let a whole bunch of people who got bitter and sour and testy about something that somebody that did them wrong stand up and talk about how wounded they were for growing up around God's people. I want to testify tonight and say we need a generation of people who know the joy of Jesus and the holiness of God and pass it on to another generation. This sour, bitter Christianity never produced any of the fruit of the Holy Spirit. And what we need are some people who ground their family in church and root their faith in the Word of God and get back to the simplicity and beauty that is in Jesus Christ and you watch what a glorious thing God will do with the truth in your life and in your family. I'm preaching tonight for my children's generation and my grandchildren's generation. I've given... The first part of my ministry, most of it, to working with young people. And I see a bunch of young people in this place tonight. I want you to know something. If Jesus tears is coming and some of these folks pass off the scene, some of you young men and young women ought to still have your families in a church like this and teach your children the same truth that you have been taught. This nonsense about looking for some new thing. You don't need a new thing. You need a fresh dose of the eternal word of the living God. They obey the truth. 
every bit of it. Look over, look over at verse number 14. The words of Jonadab, the son of Rechab, that he commanded his sons not to drink wine or perform. For unto this day, unto this day, unto this day, 300 years later, still obeying, still saying no to the wrong thing and yes to the right thing. Unto this day, they drink, what's that next word, church? None. Would you mark it in your Bible? Do you see the complete obedience? And I'm going to tell you what we've done. We've made a way to excuse our sin. We've made accommodation for our, our pet sins. Now, you don't mind when the preacher comes to town and preaches on everybody else's sin, but what about your sin, sir? What about your attitude towards your children? It's it real quiet. Well, what about children disrespectful to their parents? What about it? What about church members that won't speak to each other? What about envy and jealousy among those who are supposed to be serving God together? What about that? What about the sins of the Spirit, that cancer that grows beneath the surface until it brings forth every unholy fruit you can ever, ever, ever imagine? We, we dress up for church and sit in our church buildings and fuss at all the wickedness out there. I'm going to tell you the wickedness I'm most concerned about is not the wickedness out there. It's the wickedness in here. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? I, the Lord, search the heart. Only God really knows. And if you let God be thorough with you, he'll show you every unholy thing that disgusts him that needs to get out of our hearts. There's a complete obedience here. There's a desire and a hunger to be thoroughly right with God. Let me just show you something. Turn to Ephesians just a minute. Would you go to Ephesians just a minute? Show you a little cross-reference to this truth in the New Testament. Did you ever notice this in Ephesians chapter 5? But fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it, oh, don't miss this, Ephesians 5 verse 3, not be once named among you as become a saint. Not once. Literally, not even a hint of it. By the way, I'm preaching to me tonight. Would you pray for me? I mean this. Would you pray for me? I was with a group of senior citizens last Tuesday in South Florida. They've been studying through our little revival praying series. and It was sweet preacher. There's probably 20, 25 of them. And all, all senior saints, men and women. And, uh, and we had such a sweet time talking, praying, studying the Bible together. They meet every week to pray. They meet every week to study the Bible together one morning. And it was just so sweet. And, and when the meeting was done, I took a few questions, and we talked about lots of things. And finally, later in the back, she raised her hand, and she said, she said, uh, we thank you for what you've been teaching us about prayer. She said, could I ask you, what can we pray for you about? And I'm going to tell you, I started to say, pray for my family. I started to say, pray God give us souls. What came out of my mouth was not what I'd planned to say. I said, would you pray that God will keep me pure? Please. And she looked at me a little startled, and I said, would you please pray for me? Because I know me. And God knows me better than I know me. And you know what I know? I'm just a dressed-up sinner. That's all I am. We're all a bunch of black-hearted, hell-deserving sinners in desperate need of the mercy and grace of Almighty God. And look, I don't want a hint of it in my life. I don't want a piece of it in my life. I'm going to tell you what we've done. We've found a way to excuse our pet sins. That's what we've done. Our besetting sins. You know your besetting sin. You know your besetting sin. It's different for everybody, but everybody's got them. It's the thing that keeps getting you off course. It's the thing that most of your life you've confessed over and over and over and over and over it's the thing the devil uses like a club to beat you over the head to tell you how unworthy you are because you've done it a thousand times. It's the thing you've almost given up on and you've almost just accepted and said, well, that's just the way I am. Well, just because it's the way you are doesn't mean it's the way you're supposed to be. And somebody said, well, that's just the way I was made. No, that's your sin nature. But God is greater than your sin. Where sin abounds, grace does much more abound. And God is able to change even that area of your life and make it the greatest place of victory you have ever known. And I want you to know it's time some of us got serious about our secret sins, our besetting sins, our pet sins. You know your besetting sin. It's whatever you run to when you should run to Jesus. 
You say, well, I don't really know what that sin is in my life. All right? It's whatever you run to when you're tired and when you're discouraged that takes the place of the sufficiency of Christ in your life. And we all have them. And what book are we in here in the New Testament? The book of fullness. Look, you want God's fullness? You can't have God's fullness and be full of sin at the same time. Come down. Look at Ephesians chapter 5 again. Come down to verse number 11. And have, see if this word doesn't sound familiar, no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. No wine, no wine, no wine, none, no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness. And I wonder even right now, the Holy Spirit's doing spiritual surgery all over this room. It's not me. Don't look at me. He's working on me. He's bloodying me at this moment. The scapel of the Holy Spirit is the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. And at this moment, it's digging deep into the joints and marrow, the discerning the thoughts and intents of the heart. I wonder, what is it in you that the Holy Ghost is just opening up right now, opening wide so that you see it like he sees it? Oh, God, my pride. Oh, God, my lust. Oh, God, my, my foolishness. Oh, God, my selfishness. Oh, God, my sin. If you want to be a holy man, a holy woman, a holy family, then you must obey God's truth. Go back with me to Jeremiah chapter 35. And I'll give you a second one. Not only did they obey the truth, but secondly, they avoided temptation. Now, it's getting right down to where we live. They avoided temptation. Isn't that simple? They didn't see, pardon me, how close they could get to the edge without falling off, they saw how far away they could get. Oh, what did Proverbs say? Avoid it, pass not by it, turn from it, and pass away. Abstain from all appearance of evil. But we know we found a better kind of Christianity. We've kind of found a kind of worldly kind of Christianity where we get as close to the sin as possible, and we don't do the worst things, and we're better than most people are, and God says that's not holiness. Look at it very carefully. Look at verse number six. They're not going to drink wine. Is that right? No wine. Look what he tells them to do in verse number seven. He says, don't sow seed, don't plant a vineyard, don't have any. Huh. Look at verse nine. Nor to build houses, first to dwell in, neither have we, mark these three words, vineyard, nor field, nor seed. This is really deep. Are you ready? If you don't want to have wine, don't ever have a vineyard. That's deep, isn't it? If you don't want to have a vineyard, don't ever buy a field. And if you don't want to have a field, do not stock up on seed. Because watch this. The seed is small. There's not much in that seed. There's nothing sinful about that. Come on now. But you carry seed around with you long enough, pretty soon you'll start looking for a field to put it in. Did you know that every sin begins with a seed? Well, the small things. See, there's some people in this room right now at 50 and 60 and 70 years of age, you are fighting a jungle of your sin. You know why you're fighting a jungle of your sin? Because you refused to deal with it when it was very small. You made excuses for it when it was a seed. Sins of a lifetime begin in a person's youth. That's true in all of our lives. And I want to say to you, if you want to be holy before God, there has to come a moment in time where you say, enough is enough. I've hidden this long enough. I've excused this long enough. I blame somebody else or something else for it long enough. I'm going to deal thoroughly with it. I'm going to Come clean with God. I'm going to ask the Lord to make me clean and change me from the inside out. I say to you, if you want to be holy, you've got to avoid temptation. There's some things you can't avoid. For example, these Rechabites had the test right in front of them. Look at it. In verse 1 and verse 2, where were they? Everybody look at verse 1 and 2 again. We read it a moment ago, but where are they in verse 1 and 2? God says, bring them into the house. So here they come into the house of the Lord. That's a holy place. Hold on just a second. Did you know you can be sitting in church and be tempted? Some of you in this meeting tonight, you're, you're dealing with wandering thoughts. Listen to me. That's not unusual. No, no. There's no temptation taking you, but such as is common to man. Let's take a survey. How many of you ever opened your Bible to read your Bible or got down on your knees to pray and all of a sudden had the most awful thoughts? Would you raise your hand, please? Join the club. You know why? Because just because you're on holy ground doesn't mean all your thoughts are holy. 
So here they are. They're they're in the best of environment. And if that were not enough, look at verse number 3. They're surrounded by lots of other good people. So now there's peer pressure involved. Anybody tells you peer pressure stops when you're 18, they're lying to you, young people. Look at verse number 4. They have the consent, at least it seems, from respected people. I mean, look at verse number 4. The preacher stands up. The man of God and the princes stand up and they, they're nodding their heads saying, yep, this is what you ought to do. And if that were not enough, look at verse number five. They made it real convenient for them. They brought whole pots full of water out. Pots of it. And cups for everybody. We're going to have a party. Did you know the devil will always make it real convenient for you? And watch this. God knew that these people, it didn't matter who was around. It didn't matter where they were. And it didn't matter what anybody else said. Look, they were just going to obey what they'd been told to do. You know what I'd like to be? I'd like to be the kind of man that is the same by myself alone in a room somewhere where nobody knows and nobody sees as I am standing on this platform. How about you? There's some parts of this you can't control, but I'm going to tell you what you can control. You can control your response to it all. Do you remember what Paul wrote in Romans chapter 13 and verse number 14? He said, but make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof, but put you on the Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, watch this. Stop making it easy on yourself to sin. What is it that feeds your sin? Watch. You've got to cut that off. Whatever that channel is that feeds the flesh in you and the, the lustful desires in you, you've got to cut that off. And on the reverse side of that, watch please, you've got to feed the Christ in you, feed the spirit man in you. You've got to stop the fleshly provision and you've got to enhance the spiritual provision by the grace of God. Say, Lord, you're going to have to keep me now, but I'm going to do my best to keep myself as far away from sin as possible. How many of you believe God is able to keep us from falling? Would you raise your hand? Well, the same passage that says that God is able to keep us from falling says keep yourselves in the love of God. You stay as close to God as you can, and I guarantee you God will keep you from falling. Do you know where people fall? When they let something come between them and God. Today, Pastor, today I heard of a man who had been greatly used to the Lord and had known the Lord's blessing who now is a reproach, and it grieved me. And I said to the Lord, God, help me. God, help me. I prayed for him. But I didn't just pray for him. I prayed for me. God, help me. Let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. Better preachers than me. Better the people than any of us have fallen and brought reproach to the name of Jesus. And I'll tell you what we need. We need a people who are hungry and thirsty after righteousness and long for one thing, and that is to be made holy and to be more like the Lord Jesus Christ. How? Number one, you got to obey the truth. Number two, you got to avoid temptation. But number three, we've come full circle back to where we started today. Did you notice one other thing their daddy told him to do? He said in verse number 7, don't build a house. Instead, dwell in what? Tents. Look at verse number 9. They're not allowed to do what? Build a house. Verse number 10, what did they do? They dwelt in tents. Would you write this down, number 3? If you want to stay clean and pure and upright and holy before God, you've got to, number 1, obey the truth. Number 2, abstain from temptation best you can. And number 3, remember this is all temporary. You ever wonder why their daddy told them not to build a house? Anything wrong with building a house? We built a house. Anything wrong with living in a house, having a nice structure? No, nothing wrong with that at all. But look, there was a spiritual principle and premise behind it. He was saying to them, look, please, you are a people that are just passing through. You're not going to be here long. Do not live for this world. Watch, please. If they'd build a house, you know probably what they'd have done? They'd probably bought a field next door to the house and planted a seed and had a vineyard and had the temptation to have wine. And so what is the Lord doing for them? He's removing as much opportunity as possible. Let's just get real for a minute. Most Christians don't want to live like this. I mean, this even sounds radical, doesn't it? I mean, you start preaching like this and people say, man, he's really gone off the deep end. No, I'm going to tell you what I'm showing you. It's called Bible Christianity. 
And we've gotten so far away from it, we don't even recognize it anymore. We sound like a bunch of fanatics even talking about it. But I'm going to tell you something. When the trumpet sounds and you kneel at the feet of Jesus at the judgment seat of Christ, the only thing that's going to matter is, did you let God be thorough with you? What is it you don't want to meet God with someday? Then you better deal with it today. Because we may not have a Monday night meeting. No, that's right. We may not have a Monday night meeting. We may be meeting in a much different location on Monday night. By the way, if we meet in a different location, it's going to be a much better, better meeting, let me tell you. But I'm going to tell you, on that moment, that sobering day when you see Jesus and give an account for your life, the only thing that's going to matter was not the pleasures of this world, but what mattered to God. And these people, they got it. They understood we are just passing through, so we are not going to waste our time on things that are passing. And I wonder, what's the Holy Spirit of God speaking to you about at this moment? Somebody say, well, this is pretty tough, preacher. You think it is? You really think it is? Come down to the end of the chapter. Notice how the story ends in verse 19. Here's what God said about him. Therefore, thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Jonadab, the son of Rechab, shall not want a man to stand before me forever. <laughs> they called him crazy. But God said, I'm going to let his descendants be in my presence forever. What do you want for your children and grandchildren? I'm a daddy. You know one of the temptations for daddies? We want our kids to be accepted. Don't we want our kids to be accepted? We want our kids to fit in. We want our kids to be liked. We want our kids to make it in this world. But I'm going to tell you something. In the end, spiritual dads and moms and grandmas and grandpas have to understand it is not about this world. It is about the world to come. It is not about what men say. It is about what God knows. It is not about what you can get or enjoy. It is about what God is going to say on the judgment day. I pray tonight. Lord, stir some older people in this room like Jonadab, the son of Rechab, to say, you know what? We've been blessed with the truth. We've got to get this to the next generation. Look, this area is booming right now. Your, your area is booming right now. And all around this church, there are young families and there are young couples who are going to raise their children with no understanding of the holiness of God. You know what they need? They need to meet some strangers who really know God. And you young people, it's your turn. It is your turn. It dawned on me this week that youth is about gone from me. I find that hard to imagine and even harder to say. But I'm starting to understand youth is ebbing away from me. Listen to me. We all get our shot at it. And young people, it is your turn. It is your turn to take the truth and pass it on. Oh, dear Lord, touch the hearts of some of God's children in this place tonight. I know who I'm preaching to. I'm preaching to the Sunday night crowd, and I commend you for being here. And you're members of a wonderful church, and you got a great pastor, and you hear the Bible every week. But, dear Lord, awaken something in every one of us that is a greater heart and hunger for the holiness of God in our own lives. And I'll take it what it will take. It will take humility to confess that we are not all we are perceived to be. You are not what others think you are, and you are not what you say you are. You are what God knows you to be. And when we finally get there, then the Lord can be thorough with us.